Church, how are we today? Yeah, yeah. I hope you guys were uh, as excited as I was for the rain this morning uh, because it meant that I have to water the garden later. So that was, it's always an exciting thing there. Um, listen, th- today is going to feel a little bit like last week. So if you missed last week, then today's going to be a good add on to that. But we're speaking about this, this idea of this being of what, where do you get to when something is your last resort? And like Simon said, we spoke about desperation last week, and this week we're going to speak about desperation again. And the reason we're speaking about it two weeks in a row is because I believe that this is something that's so important to all of us to hear, because I believe that a lot of us live under or live in an enormous amount of desperation. I believe it holds us captive. And so I just want to let you know that that what you can expect from today's message is maybe something a little bit different. You know, we're going to speak with and we're going to claim authority over desperation in this room. The desperation that you feel in your hearts, in your, in your muscles, in your mind, in your emotions as you tense up when you walk into these situations where you just feel desperate. And we're going to speak with authority over those and we're going to get rid of them today. So, so people are going to get free from that today. But I'm going to walk you guys on a journey and just get you to that place so the series is called The Last Resort. What does it mean? What is it? Somebody got an update there. <laughs> That's Jesus saying, I just downloaded the Holy Spirit here. Amen? Amen. 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 We're ready to go now. So when you get to your last resort, what exactly does this mean? This means that you've tried everything that there is to try. There's nothing left to try. And you're now scraping the bottom of the barrel trying to figure out what you can do to remedy, to write, to work with your situation. But but the last resort is a place that that you go because you've done everything. I mean, you've tried everything that there, there is to try. And one of the sayings that, you know, a lot of people love to say when they talk about reaching, you know, like your last resort is that you're at the end of your rope. Okay, so there's, there's no more rope to hold on to. You're at the end of it. And as I was doing some research for this message, I found an addition to that quote, and it says, you're at the end of your rope, and then somebody says, so tie a knot to the bottom of it and hang on. And I thought, that's horrible. I don't want to hold on to the rope. I don't, I don't want to be on the rope. I want to be in, in, on soft ground. I want to be in bed. I want to be alone watching Netflix or something. You know, when I'm feeling desperate, when I'm feeling like I'm at the end of my rope, I don't want to tie a knot and hang on to it. I, I, I want to let go of it. And so what happens is when we spend too much time at the end of our rope, when we spend too much time thinking about what's my last resort to solve this problem or to deal with this issue, what it does is it leads us to a place of desperation. That, that's when we start to feel desperation that builds in our body, it builds in our senses, it builds even in your muscles. You know, those of you that, that enter these seasons of stress and you feel desperate about something, it, it, you know, your, your jaw tenses. You know, sometimes I'll wake up in the morning and I, my jaw will be sore. Like I, I'll ask Casey, you know, did I get in a, a fight in my dreams last night? Because it feels like I got, I got hit in the jaw. And, and what that is, is that's desperation. And so I, I can't speak to, I, I tried a million different ways to do this. I tried to think, okay, let me come up with three good examples where you guys can identify with, you know, desperation. Where you guys can see it. And I just realized, I can't speak to what you're desperate about. I can't speak to your desperate situation. But what I can speak to is my desperate situation. And I can speak to a situation that had me at my most desperate. And so I'm going to share that with you guys. And part of that is, is I, I want to lead you guys in being transparent and being open and being authentic. Because I want to create space where you guys can also do that with each other. This is a real church made with real people. We're, we're normal people. We're all messed up. We've all got problems. Let's just be open and honest with each other. And so my, my story that I want to share about desperation... Um, Starts back in, in 2017, Casey and I and Lifa, we moved to Cape Town to plant a, a church. We left an, our NGO that we were working in. We moved to Cape Town. So, okay, we're going to come down here. We're going to start a church. We start a brand new church. It's going to be amazing. You know, maybe in six months we'll have, you know, a couple hundred people. And literally did we know that Cape Town hates outsiders. Cape Town also doesn't talk to anybody unless you go to school with them, right? There's all, yeah, there's a little bit clicky, you know. All my uh, outside Cape Town people, are, the Durban Knights are going, yep, you know. Uh, everyone in Cape Town's like, are we going to fight him after the service? 
No, it, it was hard. It was hard for us to find our, our foot in here. And, and in 2017, the other thing I did is I realized that I've been struggling with depression and anxiety most of my whole life. And, and all my comfort zones were pulled out from under me. And I found myself in a really rough spot. And, and I remember reading a book. I found this little book at a, at, at a, at a bookstore and, and opened it up, was reading it. And it was talking about you know, overcoming you know, anxiety and, and depression. And, and it had some, some tests that you take in there that were, you know, these are kind of the clinical tests you take to diagnose whether you're you know, you suffer from depression or whatever. I remember telling Casey after taking that little test in that book, I remember walking up to her and saying, according to this book, I've got major depressive disorder. And she's like, yeah, you, you do, you know. We, I mean, it was clear, it was evident to everybody but me. And, and, that, and that, that hit me really hard is, is, is to be like, man, there, there actually is something that's, that's going on in me. And so, you know, fast forward a little bit, I immediately put myself into therapy with a counselor. I just want to say, listen, if, if you need counseling, go to counseling. You know, if you, if you want to get in shape and build muscle, you go to the gym. There's no shame in going to the gym. If you want to get in shape emotionally and build some emotional maturity, go to counseling. There, there's no shame in, in that either. So I put myself into counseling and, and that was going well. And then if we fast forward to a, a time when we were living in Newlands Forest, I, I had my first two real just major depressive breakdowns. And I've spoken about these before. You know, one of them I've called my bathroom floor moment, as I just couldn't do anything but lay on the bathroom floor and just ask God, tell God, I can't carry this anymore. I actually can't do it anymore, God. Your, your scripture says that you'll never give us more than we can handle. And God, I'm telling you that I now have more than I can handle. I need you to take this load off of my back. And so that was in 2017. And then in 2018, you know, Casey and I, we, we, uh, we got pregnant with our first biological, uh, was our biological daughter, and then with no friends, with nobody really in town, I was actually on top of Cable, uh, Table Mountain. I got a phone call from Casey that we just miscarried. And so that was Annabelle Brave was her name. And, and that was hard to get through. And, and that just kind of piled on to a lot of the way that I was feeling. And then in 2019, a year later, Benjamin came along. And, and he was supposed to be due a couple days. Uh, he was actually a, about a week late. And when Benjamin was a week late, I knew what God was doing because, see, Benjamin was born on the exact same day that we lost Annabelle Brave the week before. It was April 9th. And that, that was this amazing miracle in our lives that we got to see, you know, unfold and take place. But there was not something amazing that was happening in me. What was happening in me is I was still drowning. I was still dying. I was waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning just begging God every single morning, give me relief. Help me. Help me, God. I can't carry the load that you're giving me. And then I slipped into this very extremely low depressive state. Now, for anyone that deals with anxiety and depression, it's like anxiety was almost like a comfort zone. I could deal with anxiety. I knew how to handle, kind of, how to handle anxiety. But depression, that was scary. Depression felt like I could feel every little cell in my body dying one cell at a time. And every little cell that died felt like somebody, like a shotgun blast to my system. And I started sleeping more. I started losing interest in getting up and doing things. And I just started going down, 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 downhill. See, I was, I, I had tried running. I tried exercise. I tried, I was getting up every morning at 4 a.m. and having a quiet time. Uh, we were eating healthy. We, Casey and I had just done like a, a year-long fast from certain kinds of foods, and we were super healthy, and, and all the right pieces were in place. And even my therapist was looking at me and saying, I don't really know what to do because normally somebody in your shoes has got something majorly wrong with their life, but you're doing all the right things. And so on, on June 5th, 2019, kind of came, that, that's my birthday. I, I remember getting in bed that night. I laid down. Casey's, you know, already in bed next to me. I didn't say anything to her, and we, we didn't celebrate my birthday. I didn't want to do anything. I rolled over, and I was looking at our bathroom door. And as I'm looking at the bathroom door, I thought to myself, I'm one decision away from stepping through a doorway that leaves this world and puts me in heaven. I'm one decision all I have to do is make one decision and all this pain goes away. Everything goes away. 
I just have to step through the door. And I went to sleep that night having made the decision that probably the best thing for me to do would be to step through that door. Now, little did I know, my wife, she, she laid next to me and stayed awake the whole night with her hand on my back, praying over me. And the next morning, I was supposed to have an appointment with a therapist, and I, I, I didn't go. I, you know, I, I didn't make it. And, and, you know, Casey was calling, and my therapist was calling, and eventually they got me to go into to that appointment. I sat down with my therapist, and he confronted me on it, and I just sort of, you know, spilled the beans and just said, I, I just, I'm so desperate. I was at my most desperate state. See, when, especially just to address you know, suicide specifically. And I know a lot of people say suicide is selfish, and I don't want to try and change anybody's mind. Yes, it is a selfish thing to do. But also for me, I thought, I'm not selfish here. I actually think my family's fine. They'll be better off because I'm sort of like the downer in the family. They'll be fine. This is not me being selfish. This is me being giving. But I'm desperate. It's not about being selfish. It's about desperation. To be so desperate to think I'm one decision away from getting relief. See, that was my most desperate moment. To, to this day, it was my absolute most desperate moment. And then I, after that, just to kind of wrap the story down for you guys, you know, I, I, I went to a new therapist and, and started working through that, went to the States for a little bit, came back and, and started partnering there, got on medication, you know, hey, who's, I'm not afraid to, to say, you know what, if you need medication, then great take medication if you're struggling with this. Mental health is a real thing here. It's a real thing that we deal with. And this whole message isn't about mental health, but that's my, this is my story of desperation. You know, and I, and I remember looking at, at, at that medication list and thinking, I actually sat with, with Casey on the couch before I took my first Zoloft, which I don't know if any of you guys know about that. It's a little SSRI. Basically, your dog could eat a whole bottle of them and nothing would happen to it. And I, I'm looking at this thing, and I'm like, okay, what's this going to make me become when I take this? I was terrified, you know? And I took it, and nothing happened, you know? And, and actually, what happened with my journey through therapy and medication is I actually felt like I was unlocked to be me. It, I didn't die. I actually came alive. It was a good thing for me. And so that was, that was how I handled my most desperate moment is through Casey and, and through therapy and through medication and through all of those things. But, but I don't know what your most desperate moment is. But what I want you to know is that, is that where I'm coming from in this message is coming from a place where I looked through a doorway and I thought I'm one decision away from being done. That's desperation. That's just absolute desperation. And so that, that's why this topic means so much to me, because I feel like we all carry so much desperation in our lives. We're desperate for the economy to turn around. We're desperate for money. People are, are desperate for jobs. People are desperate for money just to pay their health insurance, to cover the simple costs that they have. There is desperation in our society. The number of people that are living on the sides of the roads are, is growing. It's increasing. The crime is going up, not just here, but everywhere, all around the world. We're living in a world that is desperate. It's, it's, it's completely desperate, living in desperation. So, so I hope that in your life, as you sit here and you listen to this, I hope that you will let yourself be vulnerable just for a moment and let yourself have access to the thing that you try not to access. See, I know what it's like to try and suppress if I suppress it, it goes away. If I suppress it, I don't have to deal with it. If I suppress it, then it's not overwhelming to me. Let yourself be vulnerable. Think about that most desperate thing in your life. And if you don't have anything in your life, then I want you to think about your friends, your family, the people that are in your circle, and maybe they've got something going on in their life. And see, that's why I say at the beginning of this message, we're going to speak with authority over this stuff. Because, because of God, I took authority and people on my behalf took authority over me and over the, the depression, the anxiety that I was dealing with. And now I don't live as a sick person. Depression is not my personality. Anxiety is not my personality. It doesn't define how I make decisions or how I lead. And it doesn't do that for you either. Your situation of desperation does not define you. In fact, today's the day where your situation of desperation gets an opportunity to end. You get an opportunity to close the door on that. 
And so in, in doing that, see, desperation leads us to places that we don't want to go. It, it, it takes you somewhere that you thought, I would never, ever go there or think about that ever. And now here I am, I'm there, and I'm thinking about it. And so what do you do when you're in that spot? What do you do when you're overwhelmed with desperation? And that's where we're going to look at today in, in Mark chapter 5. See, this is such a beautiful chapter in the Bible. I mean, the, the, the Bible is this amazing thing, but I call this the, the chapter of last resorts. Because in Mark chapter 5, there's three different stories of people that come to Jesus that are in complete desperation. It, it, it's, it's something that they would have not gone to Jesus otherwise, but because their lives were so desperate, because they were so consumed with desperation, they found themselves doing things to come to Jesus, hoping that something in their life would change. In fact, the first story in this chapter, it talks about a, a man that was demon-possessed, and, and the, the village had, had put shackles on his ankles and his hands to try and just keep him still and to keep him from running wild. And he was living in what they called the tombs or caves. And he would break the shackles off and he was uncontrollable. And, and there was just, so Jesus walks on the scene with this guy and guess who comes up to Jesus in desperation? It was the, it was the spirits that were living in this guy, the demons. They came up to Jesus in desperation and said, please don't destroy us. Can we please maybe have a chance? You know, we know that, that you are speaking in authority. You're telling us to get out. Jesus, please give us an opportunity. In fact, throw us into this herd of pigs over here. And so Jesus does. He says, fine. He throws them into a herd of pigs. The herd of pigs run off a cliff. They die. It makes everybody in town mad. But this guy, the, 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 even the spiritual world is desperate. And has desperate moments. And last week we talked about the woman that was unclean because she had this, this 12 years of bleeding and, and she wasn't able to, to live a normal life. She was seen as unclean, seen as dirty. And she took a chance and she came to Jesus and just touched the corner of his cloak. And out of that desperation, it drove her to Jesus. And she found healing for that. And we touched on this man named Jairus a little bit last week, and we're going to focus on him today. And who Jairus is, is Jairus is the leader of the synagogue. And what's important about Jairus is, is as a leader of the synagogue, he's either a Pharisee, or if he's not a Pharisee, he's someone that's high up in the ranks of, of the, the sort of the Jewish religion. The Pharisees are at the top. And, and he would have been the person that would be in charge of the order of the synagogue. So making sure everything's where it needs to be and, and making sure that the incense is in place and the sacrifices are ready and that people are orderly. And then he's also managing kind of the service of the synagogue. So he's, you would almost consider him kind of like the, the, the pastor of the synagogue there. So let me just draw some attention to this. The synagogue in Jesus, it's kind of like oil and water. Because every time Jesus goes near the synagogue or the temple... The Pharisees get mad at him and they throw him out. Just also remember, take note, that the synagogue, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the people that are in this synagogue, in this little church temple, the Jewish church temple, they're the ones that put Jesus on the cross. See, Jesus, when he went to be baptized with John the Baptist, the Pharisees were called snakes and vipers because they were after Jesus. The Pharisees attack Jesus when they think he breaks the Sabbath. The Pharisees try and sabotage Jesus by asking him which of the, of the Ten Commandments is the greatest. The Pharisees are, are trying to bring Jesus to a place where they can put him to death. And here you have Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. And look at what he does. So in, in, our, in our chapter of lost, last resorts, our chapter of hope, this is what Jairus does. So Jairus, this man, says when, he, when, he, when Jesus had again crossed over the boat to the other side of the sea. So Jesus had just dealt with the pigs and stuff. He gets in a boat, comes to the other side of the sea. He leaves the Gentile side, which is the non-Jewish side. Now he comes to the Jewish side. This is the side where people, where, where, where it's Jewish culture that reigns there and Jewish religion. And a large crowd gathered around him. It's got a big crowd. And so he decided he's going to stay by the, sea, by the seashore. So Jesus is not in the temple. He's by the ocean, by the shore. So it's not like he walked into the temple and then Jairus came up, seen him, fell, fell at his feet. It, it's not like, like Jesus walks in the temple and Jairus comes in. No, Jairus has to leave the temple 
and has to go to the sea. So he hears that Jesus is in town and he leaves and he goes to Jesus. And then not only does he go to Jesus, but he falls at his feet. Karina, you can go back to the verse there. Jesus, he falls at his feet. There is no way on earth that this should be happening. There is no reason for Jairus to fall at the feet of Jesus. This should not happen. It's easy for us to read this and to say, okay, Jairus came and he fell at his feet, da 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 da, and we move on with the verse. But I want you to, to understand that, that what we're witnessing happened here and what was being witnessed in, in real time with Jesus was, should have been an absolute impossibility. This man would have been risking his life to do this. This man would have been risking excommunication, being thrown out of the temple to do this. There's nothing that could justify a leader of a synagogue falling at the feet of Jesus. Not one single thing. But he does. And now, in the next verse, we see why. And so Jairus, at his feet, on his knees, anxiously begs him. So he didn't just beg him. He anxiously begged him. That, it, that there was an anxiety in him. And he says, and this is the reason why Jairus was at his last resort. He says, my little daughter, who's 12, is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. See, but before I go on, I, I just want to settle on this a little bit. This is what drove Jairus to, G to Jesus. This was his desperation. He had a little girl who was sick. And J Jairus had money. He was uh, in good standing. He had wealth, which meant that he would have had access to doctors. He would have had access to the finest uh, sacrificial elements that he could sacrifice on her behalf. Jairus was not wanting or hurting for help. It's not like the woman who was bleeding that we talked about last week who had access to nobody and nothing. Jairus had everything. And he finds himself at the feet of Jesus because... He's afraid that his daughter is going to die. Now, for anyone that's lost a kid, I mean, my heart breaks for you. As I stood up here during worship, and Casey with, with Benjamin, you know, our, our smallest one, or not Benjamin, Wyatt, our smallest one next to me, you know, he just had my finger up, and he just held my finger during worship. And to think that, that I could be in a situation where he's sick, Man, that would drive me to a desperate point. So this is Jairus' desperation. His little girl, who he loves, who he can't do anything else for. He goes to Jesus and he begs him, come, lay your hands on her and heal her. And so Jesus does what, what we now are not surprised. But maybe in his day, Jairus would have been very surprised at this. In verse 24, Jesus went with him. And then a large crowd followed him, and he pressed in around him from all sides. But Jesus went with him. And see, out of this little interaction that Jairus and Jesus have, you know, we can actually gain some stuff there that would help us. And, and Jairus does some things that we're going to talk about. And these are actually things that I did when I came out of my most desperate moment, my most desperate time. And, and it kind of leads you to the question, and what I want to kind of us to, to answer and to look at is... As, and I want to transition us into these things that we can do, but we have to kind of wonder, like, okay, I've got all this desperation. We've talked about it. You've made me identify it. You've gave me, you know, scripture that shows how another man dealt with desperation. But what about me sitting here in the chair? Maybe I don't, I haven't had that experience with Jesus yet. So th these are things that we can do. And it's, it's how can we bring our desperation to a place of help? So you have a sense of desperation about something, I believe that Jesus has an answer for you, but how do you get from you, how do you get it to Jesus? And this is something where my heart breaks for you completely, because as I'm writing this message, I'm thinking, how do I get you to connect with the desperation that you feel and that you have, and how do I get you to Jesus so that he can take that from you? That, that, that to me is the hardest part. Is, is getting you to run out of your synagogue, out of your temple, away from your culture, away from your peers, away from everything that influences you, and find yourself at the shore of the sea on your knees, begging at the feet of Jesus. And so when we look at how can we bring desperation to a place of help, Jairus does, does three things. 
The first thing that he does is he bows at his feet and he surrenders. See, for Jairus to get down on his knees and bow at Jesus' feet, Jairus had to surrender his culture, what other people thought about him, what other people would wonder about him. Jairus just had to let all of it go. He had to surrender everything. Surrender all of his preconceived notions. Surrender everything that everyone had ever said about Jesus. Good, bad, ugly, not ugly. Jairus had to let it go. So we bow at his feet and we surrender. Now, I literally found myself on my knees in the fetal position Bowing and surrendering to God. God, I don't know how to do this or what to do, but I know the first step that I do is I come to you and I surrender. I let go. And when it comes back up, I surrender again and again and again and again. You know, some of us need to come to the feet of Jesus and surrender. Those of you that have known Jesus for all of your life, you take this for granted that this is still a viable option for you. For those of you that don't know Jesus at all, well, this is the best news for you, because Jairus didn't know Jesus. And when he came to the feet of Jesus and surrendered, it started a process of dealing with his desperation. Now, the second thing that Jairus did is he asked Jesus to help and to heal his situation. He said, Jesus, will you help me? Will you come and will you heal my daughter? So this isn't complicated for us either. We go to Jesus, we bow, we surrender, and we say, Jesus, can you help me? Not only Jesus, can you help me, but Jesus, can you help and can you heal me? Jesus, can you help and can you heal the person that I'm standing in the gap for? But Jesus isn't going to heal or he's not going to help if you're not surrendered. And so the third thing that, that Jairus does here that we learn from is that he goes with him when he moves. So Jairus surrendered at his feet. He asked Jesus for help. And then Jesus went with him to his house. So he went. Now, if you find yourself where you're at a place where you can't bow at the feet of Jesus and surrender, you can't ask Jesus for help to heal, and you can't go with him then when he moves, then there, there's something going on. What, what's happening inside of you? Is it, you know, for some of you, it's just because you don't know Jesus. This is like maybe your first or second time hearing about Jesus. And you know what, that, that's okay. I don't, I don't, you don't need to feel any, no guilt, no condemnation. You just sit back and hang out. Okay, that's fine. But for those of you that know Jesus, for those of you that proclaim that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and you're carrying around desperation, and you can't get on your knees and surrender to God, then you've got to ask, what is it? Is it pride? Is it fear? Is it, is it uh, uh, like insecurity? What, what is it that, that would take you all the way up to the seashore, looking at Jesus there, and you look around, and I'm not going to bow at Jesus' feet and ask for help because I'm afraid of what someone around me would think of me. I, I'm afraid of what my, my family would think, or I'm, in, I'm insecure about myself, but there's a reason in you. And that reason in you that keeps you out of this position is the greatest lie that the devil would want you to believe. Because if he can keep you from surrendering to Jesus, then he's got control of your whole life. He keeps you in that, that desperation. Because when you're desperate, it drives you. It drives you to a place that you otherwise wouldn't go. And if you don't go to Jesus, then you're going to go to alcohol, drugs, pornography, you're going to go to unhealthy relationships. You're going to go to some kind of toxicity in your life through people or through substances. You're going to go somewhere. You can only live in desperation for so long. And you're going to go somewhere. So as a Christian, why not, why not go here? Now, one of the things just continuing that, that I had to learn and when I went to Jesus in my desperation and when I started to get help from my most desperate things is, is it wasn't like an immediate fix. It didn't just all of a sudden, you know, I didn't pop off the ground and, and say, you know, I'm healed. I've never, ever felt stressed again in my life. Like, that's not what happened. See, if you, if you come out of desperation, it's a journey. It's not immediate, and it takes some time. And, and, and that's something that's hard to, hard to wrap your head around, because you want it to be fixed now. You, 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 want, you want it to be taken care of now. But it takes time. 
It's a journey. And we see that in Jairus' life because, see, what happened when Jairus fell at the feet of Jesus, surrendered, he asked Jesus to go with him. Jairus says, cool, let's go. And while they're walking over to Jairus' place, guess what? There's a crowd that gathers around him. And then there's a woman that comes up and she touches Jesus' cloak. And Jesus says, I felt the power leave me. And he, he, there's this whole scene where he heals this woman and then publicly he proclaims her clean so that she's no longer a castaway. And while Jesus is still talking about that, a servant from Jairus' house runs up to Jesus and Jairus and says, Jairus, your daughter is dead. She's died. And then right after that, some officials, some, some fellow synagogue officials tell Jairus, okay, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Why are you bothering this teacher? See, they didn't see him as Jesus. They saw him just as a teacher, as a rabbi. They said, why are you still bothering him? It's done, man. It's done. She's dead. And so Jairus still goes with Jesus. I, I can't imagine what the second half of that trip would be like, walking with Jesus, who you're still not all the way sure about, to go home to where your daughter, who is dead, is at. And see, what... What happens is, is, is when we make a choice to go with Jesus, that there are things that come next. There are more things, you know, that, that happen. And so if we, if we look at, at Mark here, and, and Mark, this is what I was talking about. It says, while he was still speaking, some people came from the synagogue saying, Jairus, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher? Isn't that just a little bit insensitive? Hey, your daughter's dead. Why are you still bothering this guy? And then, then it goes on in verse 36. Overhearing what was being said, Jesus said to the synagogue officials, so here's what Jesus says that you do next. All right? This is why this is important. You've surrendered. You've, you've uh, asked Jesus for help. You've gone with him. You're in for the journey. It's taken a little bit of time. Maybe the thing that you wanted not to happen did happen. You didn't want your daughter to die. She did die. You didn't want... The, the, the desperation that you've been afraid of to come to fruition, and it did come to fruition. And what do you do next? Jesus answers it. He says, do not be afraid. Only keep on believing in me and in my power. Keep believing in me. Keep believing. It's a constant. It's, I'm going to keep believing. When the prayer doesn't come through, I'm going to keep believing. When the house doesn't come through, I'm going to keep believing. When I wake up and I'm still having panic attacks, I'm going to keep believing. You keep believing. You never stop. Keep pursuing. Keep believing. Believe in my power. And then he allowed no one to go with him as witnesses. So Jesus said, none of you jokers are coming with me. I'm only grabbing my three most trusted people. And so he grabs Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And then they're going to now go to the house with, with the dad. And so in verse 38, we get the rest of this. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he looked. This is talking about Jesus. Jesus looked with understanding at the uproar and commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing and mourning. See, Jairus would have had his family, and oftentimes people would even pay people to come and mourn and weep loudly as a kind of a show of respect for the, those that had passed away. And that's what's happening here. Jesus comes in, and he sees the scene, and I love how the Amplified Bible tells us that it's not that he looked, but the connotation to how he looked was he looked with understanding. He understood why people were sad. He understands why when you come to him that you're still sad. He understands your weeping. He understands your mourning. He understands it. He looks at you and sees it with understanding. You may not feel like you're seen. I'm here to tell you, you are seen by Jesus, and he understands the pain that you're going through. And then in verse 39, Jesus, when he had gone in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is sleeping. And then they began laughing scornfully at him because they knew that the child was dead. You know, what's interesting about this to me is this reveals that Jesus sees your situation different than you're able to see your situation. Is that we look at our situation through our eyes. The child is dead. My, there is no cure to my desperation. I will just always be this way. I will always deal with this. I'll never get out of this situation, especially now. Especially now that this thing has actually happened. I mean, it'd be very easy for this father. I mean, dead is dead. That's pretty simple. It's dead. Done. There is no more after that. 
And he sees them, but Jesus sees it differently. So she's not actually dead. She's sleeping. So what is the death in your life that you see as a death that Jesus could speak into with understanding and say, no, 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 it's not that. Actually, it's just sleeping. See, I, Jesus, your Lord and Savior, see the big picture of your life, and I see it differently than you see it. I see the truth. And that's why Jesus tells the man in the verse previously, he says, keep believing in me. Because if he didn't keep believing in him, if he had gotten mad and thrown Jesus out or gone a different direction from Jesus or told him to take a hike, you know, as my dad would say, take a, a, a long hike on a short dock. Anybody get that? You know, I, I was about 17 when I understand, oh, that means you're going to walk off the dock into the water, you know. That if he had done that, then he wouldn't get Jesus' perspective on his daughter. He would go home and just see that his daughter had died. But Jesus sees it differently. And Jesus is there because he kept believing in Jesus and in his power. And so people were laughing at this. And then it, it goes on for the rest of verse 40, and it says, the, the, Karina, you can put, thank you very much. It says, but he made them all go outside, and he took, so he kicks everybody out. He says, gone, all of you, gone, all the mourners, all the wailers. I'm going to clear this house out, especially all of you that are laughing, because I'm trying to do something special here. You're all out of here, and now it's just the child's father and the mother and then Jesus' his three companions, his three, most, was his three most trusted and beloved disciples, and they entered the room where the child was. They entered the place that desperation had, had, had its source. They entered the source of the man's desperation. Jesus will take you and your significant other, whoever's intimate with you in your life, Jesus will take you and will take them, and he will go into what is your source of desperation. And he walks into that source of desperation where, where everyone thinks that there's a dead little 12-year-old girl in there, and he changes the outcome because he sees it differently than we do. And so Jesus takes the child's hand, and he said tenderly to her, I wonder what that would have, what Jesus' tender voice would have sounded like. Talitha kum is what he said, which translates from Aramaic. It means, little girl, I say to you, get up. And the little girl, she immediately got up and she began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they who witnessed the child's resurrection, they were overcome with great wonder. See, Jesus walked in, changed the whole situation there. So we're gonna, I've got three things that I want us to finish on here. And I think this is important because with desperation comes this thing called guilt. It comes this thing called shame. It's this thing that we often feel like embarrassed or afraid to talk about. Or we feel like we don't want to open up and tell people about our desperate situation. You know, so this man that we've been talking about, Jerry's, he does all that. He takes the risk. He opens up. He brings Jesus into his home. Jesus walks into his source of desperation, brings healing there, shows that he sees it. You know, another amazing thing is that Jesus does this intimately. He wants to do it intimately with you. He clears out, in the story, he cleared out all the mourners, all the wailers, all the people laughing. In your life, he'll clear out the negative thoughts. He'll clear out the people that don't believe in you. He'll clear all that out. He wants to get alone with you in an intimate way and do a work in you. He wants to get into your source of desperation. And he wants to change it. But we have to understand that we got to let go of the way we feel about it. You can't be so strong with how you feel or else you're going to hold on to that desperation no matter what. So for those of you that worry... What's going to happen about my desperation? And for those of you especially, if you're new and you're new to Jesus, you may think to yourself this question, what does Jesus think of my desperation? What, is it, what, what do you think that Jesus thinks about your desperation? When I was laying in bed that night, staring at the bathroom door, thinking I'm one decision away from, from relief, what do you think Jesus thought of my desperation? So th this is where some amazing truth comes for us because the first thing that you need to understand is that God does not shun you because of your desperation. In fact, when you're desperate, God is there for you. When you turn to God, he turns to you. 
When you reach out to God, God turns an ear to you. There's nothing you can do that pushes God away, that drives God away. He's, he doesn't feel shunned because you are desperate. He, he, he's not insecure about who he is. The second you decide to turn to him, he turns to you. The second thing that God feels about, that God doesn't feel about your desperation is, is this. God isn't put off by being your last resort. I, I don't know if any of you were ever picked for school sports I grew up and I was about this tall and about this wide. And so every time we had sports, it was, you know, I was picked last for, for a lot of things. And, and, and in that, there's almost like an offensiveness, like, man, I got picked last. You know, you're like, come on, I thought we were bros. I thought we were friends. Why didn't you? Or if you show up somewhere, you know, at a party or at a gathering and you, I don't know who's ever accidentally been invited somewhere. And you, do you realize when you walk in, I was not supposed to be here. You know, and there's a great offense that you can take from that. But Jesus, he's, he's not put off by being your last resort. He's not offended. Instead, Jesus is saying, finally, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you for coming to me. And then the last thing I want you to understand is that desperation deepens your intimacy and your relationship with God. See, I can tell you a story about a tree. When you look at big oak trees that, that have just these big, huge trunks, a big old tree. And in the wind, when the wind hits them, they have to, because they're so big, they have to stand up to the wind to not be blown over. And because they have to stand up to the wind, they have to be strong, they have to get strong. And, and because of that, the oak tree puts its roots down. And so the trees that take the most abuse from the wind, from the elements, from nature, have the deepest, most secure, most stable roots. And so what Jesus wants to do with us is our desperation deepens your intimacy and your relationship with God. I can tell you that I have never entered intimacy on levels like this, like Jesus is talking about here, except for when I was at my most desperate. Because there's just nothing left of you. You're just wide open. You are raw, you're wide open, you're not holding anything back anymore. There's nothing more that you're trying to cover up. It's just you being honest with you. And in that moment, you can achieve an intimacy with your heavenly father unlike anything else. And that intimacy is a beautiful, beautiful thing. When I look back on my time, going through those hard, desperate times, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world because it made me who it made me. And I discovered an intimate Jesus that intimately loved me deeper than I could have ever known. See, Jesus wasn't upset with me that I was considering to walk through a door that I shouldn't walk through. Jesus didn't get mad at me for that. He didn't get upset for me for that. It broke his heart. And he met me on an even more intimate level. So I, I want to leave you guys with a question that I left us with last week. And it's this. If you let your desperation bring you to Jesus, just imagine what he could do for you. Imagine the healing that he would bring you. Imagine the work that he would begin in you. Imagine the intimacy that you would feel with him. So this is where we are this morning. So we did this a couple weeks ago where we just decided, hey, we're just going to take action. We're just going to, we're just going to, we're going to do it. It's like jumping into the, into the pool when you know it's cold. It's hard to tiptoe into it. It's, not, it's easier just to, to jump in and cannonball into it. Take it all at once. Rip off the Band-Aid. And you've got an opportunity to do that this morning because if you let your desperation bring you to Jesus, imagine what he's going to do for you. So I want to give you a chance today to let your desperation bring you to Jesus. And so before I pray and before the band comes out to lead us in a song of worship, I just would, would go ahead and ask that our, our prayer partners would start to make their way to the corners down here. And what's going to happen this morning is those of you that are sitting out there that, that are ready to surrender to Jesus, you're ready to run to his feet, you're ready, you're just tired of living in the desperation that you're living in, and you want to claim this truth, if you're wondering, what would happen if I bring my desperation to Jesus? What could he do for me? Listen, I'm telling you, it's amazing. What he can do for you, what he will do for you is absolutely amazing. It'll change your life 
forever. I'm a walking testimony of that. And so I'm going to give you that opportunity today. When, when I pray and I say amen, we're all going to stand up. The band is going to lead us in a song of worship. We're going to have prayer partners in the corners. These prayer partners are not the key, the solution to your desperation. They, I did not give them anything that's going to solve your problems. All they're there to do is to enter into your desperation with you, hold you by the hand, and guide you to Jesus. That's it. It's just a friend. Just a friend to help you get there. Because if you can only muster the strength to get to the front, they'll take you the rest of the way. We want to make it easy for you. And so without hesitation, when I say amen and we sing, those of you that you know you need to move, you know you need to come to Jesus, I just want you to get up and come.